This is The Future Of, where experts share their vision of the future and how their work is helping shape it for the better. I'm Jessica Morrison. The dominance of English as the language of business and scientific exchange, as well as in popular culture, has cemented its place as the world's most popular second language, with an estimated 2 billion speakers. It is constantly evolving as it continues to be used by speakers in multilingual settings and as new technologies and ideologies enter the fold. In this episode, I was joined by Dr. Lisa Lim, an Associate Professor at Curtin University's School of Education, consultant to the Oxford English Dictionary, and writer of the Language Matters column in the South China Morning Post. We chatted about English's place as the world's lingua franca, or common language, the growth of different contact varieties of English, and the changing nature of slang. Dr. Lim also talked about her own research journey and important topics of conversation that she thinks should be covered more by linguists. If you'd like to find out more about this research or read Dr. Lim's column, you can visit the links provided in the show notes. Lisa, how did English become the world's lingua franca and do you expect it to remain a global language in the future? Thanks for that question, Jess. It's a long story and it really could take a whole semester's course. But let's take the first half of that question first as a start. But I think it's important for understanding the future of English, so do bear with me. Imagine at the beginning of the 17th century, there were five to seven million speakers of English, almost all on the British Isles. But between the end of Elizabeth I's reign in 1603 and the beginning of Elizabeth II's reign in 1952, there was an increase of some 50-fold to about 250 million speakers, the majority outside the British Isles. And nowadays, you know, people estimate something like 2 billion people in the world who have some competence in English. So, you know, the question, how did this really happen in the first British Empire or, or the first diaspora? What we had was the British expansion in the Americas in the 17th, 18th century to Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the 18th, 19th century. And The purpose of this was to make a new home, to escape persecution, to seek new opportunities. So what there was were large-scale migrations of peoples from England, Scotland and Ireland and substantial settlement of large numbers of first language speakers of English who then, you know, eventually shifted identities, established their new home, multiplied, also displaced and competed with the pre-colonial population for land and for resources. But what, what we had there, what are called settlement colonies, right, for settlement uh, places. And the kinds of varieties of English that evolved there are viewed as, well, various terms, but mother tongue or native varieties of English. And then you have the second, what is known as the Second British Empire, the Second Diaspora, um, sometime in the late 18th century with the agrarian and industrial revolutions in Britain. There was the need to service rapidly growing industries of burgeoning capitalist economy. So new sources of raw materials had to be sought, markets for goods, profitable places for investment of surplus capital. And so what there was was establishment of trading posts in new territories, you know, uh, the seeking of controlling sea routes. And so in these new territories, what there was was ruled by long distance from the home country. And in fact, the British East India Company can be seen as one of the most successful chapters in the British Empire's history, um, where in 1600 they were granted a royal charter by Elizabeth I with the intent to favour trade privileges in India and so establish Britain's spread in those areas. And so what transpired there, what, is, what are known as non-settler communities or exploitation colonies, as mentioned. And so in these places, in various African countries, in various countries in Asia, you had the development of what are seen as second language varieties, also known as new Englishes. And this this is a term that's widely used in our fields of study. We can also recognize a third type of colony, plantation colonies, right, where the purpose was to extract resources, again, sparser settlement, fewer English um, speakers, mostly the plantation owners, governors, etc. But interestingly, what happens there? What happened there was that the pre-colonial populations were replaced by new labor from elsewhere, principally West Africa, right, and with the slave trade. And so these colonies were found in the Caribbean, in the American South. 
And the kinds of varieties that typically emerge there are those which are known as plural language varieties. So that's British Empire. And um, obviously, over time, we saw changes in these diasporas where the populations of these overseas um, so-called native speaker, English-speaking settler colonies increased. They became states. For example, when the US and Australia became independent from Britain, this really helped prompt to catalyze the linguistic differences between this different, these different um, English varieties. In the non-settler, the exploitation colonies, English started becoming very widespread in such populations so that newer generations really had English as part of their repertoires, right? And, and were no longer second language speakers, but really populations which had English as a first and dominant language. After the formal age of empire declined, obviously there were the world wars. And I'm just fast forwarding to post-World War II, where the continued spread and establishment of English around the world really was due to the power and prestige of the US economy, of technology, and of culture. You also had the language being transmitted through English as a foreign language material, through the media, TV, television, radio, and so on. Even beyond that, you had countries, or you have countries which are seen as English-seeking countries, as it's termed in the literature, where you know, English has such um, a value in, in today's world that you know, all countries are seeking to have it as an important language in society. That's, you know, that's the history of how English got to where it is. But as to the second part of your question, whether it will remain a global language in the future, I mean, that's you know, the million dollar question, because honestly, one really can't predict anything for certain. All kinds of eventualities could transpire. The new political allegiances or regional trading blocks could develop in Asia or in Latin America, which could have an impact on the English language. There could be world-changing technological innovations in other non-English speaking parts of the world, which could have an impact on, on the English language's status. But assuming that things continue the way they are, with English being really quite entrenched all over the world, then I think, and you know, this also comes from my research interests, what's crucial and really interesting and exciting is that we recognize that it's not just English in the singular, the English language, but Englishes in the plural. And I hope that already has emerged in my discussion of the history of, of the English language, because what we have are, you know, varieties of English all around the world which have emerged and have taken on lives of their own. And I, in particular, I want to focus on the new Englishes, um, those that emerged in the non-settler or the exploitation colonies, as I mentioned earlier. The two factors, I think, that are really very exciting. First, these new Englishes evolved in settings that were multilingual. Many other local languages and languages which are from very different families than in the English language. So you have for example, if you think of Singapore as a case in point, you have various Chinese languages, you have you know, Malay, you have various um, languages of South Asia, both from Indo-Aryan as well as from the Dravidian families. And so these languages have very different structures, different linguistic features, and these influence the English language that develops in these localities so that English really becomes quite characteristic of these different ecologies. So I think that's one very interesting factor, thinking about the English of today and the future. And so then if we consider the demographics of speakers of English today, it's really interesting to think where the center of gravity lies, right? The majority of speakers, English speakers nowadays, are found outside the traditional bases of the UK, the US, Australia, etc. So China, for example, is a huge English learning country, huge numbers of English language learners there. And so the majority of interactions that are happening around the world in English, in varieties of English, are not primarily between, you know, the so-called traditional native speakers or between, you know, a learner and a native speaker, but really between all these different varieties of English, and I have a slight bias for Asia because that's what I do my research on, but certainly, you know, Asia is a big center for where the future of English or where various interesting uh, developments in English 
is happening. Thanks, Lisa. You certainly weren't wrong there about that extensive answer. You did touch on uh, new Englishes, so I'm hoping we can delve into that a little bit further. Some words from new Englishes and English lexified pigeons and creoles aren't recognised in official English dictionaries. Why is this important and what progress is being made to have them recognised in official dictionaries? This is such an important and exciting issue, Jess, because people do turn to dictionaries not just as a source of information, but also look upon them as a body that in a way gives a stamp of approval or as we say in Hong Kong English, a chop. <laughs> a little anecdote to start. About a decade and a half ago, during the time when I was teaching at the University of Hong Kong and also whenever I was running workshops on World Englishes, one little activity I like to use to challenge the audience's thinking was to give them a list of lexical items, or rather a few lists, and ask them to imagine themselves as lexicographers making decisions about what to include in a dictionary. And I'd first give them items like council house, um, mobile phone, cookie, noodles, spaghetti, cappuccino, latte, ketchup, focaccia, cafeteria. Okay, that list, yes, 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 no problem usually. And then words like void deck, which is a particular kind of space at the bottom of public housing in Singapore. Milk tea, a particular kind of tea in Hong Kong, but you know, not unlike latte. Pak choy, a particular kind of leafy green vegetable. Mm, people start, you know, scratching their heads. And then words like nai cha, which is milk tea in Cantonese. Cha siu pao, these roasted pork dumplings. Um, pansiteria, so like a cafeteria, but selling pancit, which are your sort of traditional Filipino noodles. Kopitiam, a coffee shop, but in Malay and Hokkien. This is from Singapore and, and Malaysia. And then people started, you know, saying yes, no, and in huge dis discussions ensued. And it really made for provocative and thoughtful discussions, not just about interrogating the various standards and ideologies and attitudes that we all hold with regard to comparable items across varieties of English, but, you know, it also placed us in the shoes of lexicographers having to wrangle with such issues about decisions and choices and feasibility and inclusion. And there are a few interesting issues to unpack, you know, in this issue about English dictionary making and the, 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 the place of new Englishes and English lexified pigeons and creoles. I think first we should acknowledge that actually there have been dictionaries or there are dictionaries documenting specific new Englishes or creole languages, usually compiled by linguists doing research on those varieties. For example, there's a dictionary of Trinidad and Tobago English Creole, a dictionary of Hong Kong English, and a dictionary of Singlish and Singapore English that you can find online. But it's very true, as your question points out, that for the longest time, lexis from new Englishes and English lexified pigeons and creoles were not, have not been included in more mainstream established dictionaries. But all that is changing as we speak. Okay? And we can actually recognize a couple of thrusts. On the one hand, you have additions which encompass, encompass you know, some items from certain new varieties. So there is the Macquarie Regional in Asian English Dictionary. So Macquarie was very well known for actually putting Australian English on the map with the Macquarie Australian English Dictionary also subsequently were consulted and, and um, you know, supported uh, producing something for Asian Englishes. Times Chambers also produced the Essential English Dictionary, which included various entries from Singapore and Malaysian English. And then there is, of course, the Oxford English Dictionary, which just about a decade or so ago took an explicit decision to foreground an inclusion of entries from World Englishes. They had, they had already been doing so since time immemorial, but the intention was to really significantly increase the scope. And to do that, they appointed a World English editor whose brief obviously was to focus on World Englishes. And in addition to that, they recognize the value of collaborating with academia and researchers in such lexicographic work. And so the OED has actually approached numerous academics to act as consultants on World English varieties. 
I happen to be a consultant for them and I, I, I advise on Singapore English and Hong Kong English, which is lots of fun. And uh, most recently, the chief editor and the world English editor of the OED, as well as the OUP publisher for South Africa and myself, we co-chaired the Oxford World English Symposium, which had talks on various varieties of world Englishes, as well as brought together academics and lexicographers and poets and, and writers uh, in conversation to talk about, you know, this whole issue of new Englishes, world Englishes, Creoles, etc., and English dictionary making. And what's exciting about dictionaries nowadays is that they're not only in print, so one doesn't actually have to wait 10 years or 20 more years for the next edition to come out. Updates happen much more swiftly in real time online. So the OED, for example, is updated on a quarterly basis. And these updates make up their third edition. And, you know, one substantial part of the updates is really this increase in world English entries. So for example, late last year, their September 2021 update included many words of Korean origin, such as skinship and Hallyu, as well as many words from Caribbean English, including a very colourful term, to eat parrot head, which actually indicates that a person chatters incessantly or is excessively talkative. I had to turn to the OED to look this up. And it's really exciting, you know, that this is happening in real time. And what also is very interesting in terms of dictionary making nowadays is that in addition to everything being online, technology allows us, allows dictionary makers to use crowdsourcing. So for example, some years ago, the OED, when they were working on Philippine English, they had an online site where anyone could write in and suggest words and and, and provide you know, the meanings for them. And this helped the OED keep their finger on the pulse, as it were, of what's going on in real time. Anybody can write in. So if any listeners out there have something that they want to suggest to the OED, please go online and go ahead. So from where I stand, it's looking really bright for New Englishes and English lexified pigeons and creels in terms of dictionary making. And why it's, why it's important is really because of what this means for users, not that speakers of English, you know, need to be told that it's all right to speak Singapore English or it's all right to, you know, say in Caribbean English, eat parrot head or whatever. But I think the fact that such items are included in, you know, in established dictionaries lends it a certain amount of legitimization, right? And um, it also raises awareness to users about such issues of, you know, variation across different or world Englishes. I tell you, when a few years back, when you know new world Englishes started being um, introduced and, and announced on the OED, there was such a flurry of excitement in the media and amongst users. They, they, the, you know, the, the re responses that you you saw um, online and so on were just so positive and so inspiring. And um, yeah, so I think it's it's a good time for Englishes worldwide and for dictionary making. Certainly a lot of progress being made there. You talked about real-time updates with dictionary making and alluded to how technology has allowed that to happen. Um, so can you elaborate a little further how technology has changed our use of English? Oh, that's such a, um, a question for, for this day and age, right? Technology has changed our use of English and the English language itself so significantly on so many levels. And I'll just sort of list a few of these. So the fact that we send emails or we can send messages on mobile phones that we can participate in online, you know, group discussions and chats and so on really allows users to straddle what were once sort of two very separate um, domains, right? The written word, uh, which the written language, which tended to be much more formal, which had many more rules and expectations, and you know, spoken a domain, which was much more spontaneous and informal, and so on. But computer-mediated communication, and I'll use this acronym CMC, yeah? computer-mediated communication, really straddles this these two domains, right? So 
your writing or texting, as it were, but there's a lot of informality there. So that's really changed how we interact with each other, how we write to each other. I'm a bit of a dinosaur. So when I'm emailing, I'm, I still start off my salutation as with, you know, dear so-and-so. But across the board, I think people are writing hi, so-and-so. Students are writing to lecturers, hi, so-and-so. People are leaving off salutations. They're leaving off um, signing off their names and so on, right? So it's really affecting how we interact. Obviously, all the new technology brings about new vocabulary, right? Nowadays, we think nothing of talking about uh, Googling something or tweeting something or talking about an app, right? And these are all terms which have either been developed or terms which existed before but had a completely different meaning, like tweet, for us to be able to speak about all our new experiences which involve technology. Also, technology has some constraints, right? Especially in the early days where sending an SMS cost money. I don't know how many listeners remember those days. Um, <laughs> the numbers of characters that one can use, you know, when one's, one tweets and so on means that we are a bit mindful about word count, we're mindful about readability. So abbreviations and acronyms, of course, have come to the fore. Something like LOL for laugh out loud, which, which came from you know, internet groups, right? Now has become a word in its own right, lol, not just in CMC, not just in computer-mediated communication, but, you know, is used and crosses over into other discourse, right? Spoken discourse, people say lol, just like that. And many, many other examples besides. People who interact solely online, right? Online communities, people who just meet in online games or Tumblr or Reddit, who develop and establish their own norms. And there are different styles, actually, that you can find uh, in these different online communities. In terms of the diaspora, you have online communities for people like Jamaican Creole speakers who are no longer in Jamaica, but you know all around the world. And online communities, diaspora communities such, such as those also develop their own uh, norms, which actually have been shown to have evolved and be different from those used by the sort of local in-person community. And then, of course, on the internet, things go viral. So language change happens at a, a pace, you know, that outstrips anything before trends catch on and spread instantly. Well, as a consequence of the globalisation of English, there are these new dialects, styles and blends developing. Can you tell me a little bit more about the rise of Kongish? Yes, thanks, Jess. Um, the story of Kongish, which is another term for Hong Kong English, is very interesting because what you have is Hong Kong, which for a period of time obviously was a British colony, at least from the People's Republic of China. And so you have English as one of the official languages alongside Cantonese and Mandarin. But by and large, the population in Hong Kong is Cantonese dominant, yeah? Cantonese speaking. So on an everyday basis, you, know, you would have uh, people speaking in Cantonese. English tended to be used in domains such as the government, legislation, you know, more formal domains, as well as in education. And what's interesting is that, you know, when a language, in this case the English language, um, is more confined to certain domains and less used, let's say, spontaneously on an everyday basis, then, you know, it may evolve uh, in a, a different way. But what's happened with Hong Kong and uh, the young people in Hong Kong is that with computer-mediated communication, right, texting and so on on the mobile phones, as I mentioned earlier, young people texted using Chinese characters, but also often preferred to either Romanize, meaning write out, you know, the pronunciation of Cantonese using a Latin script, spelling things out, or, you know, mix English with their Cantonese. So what computer-mediated communication allowed was for an area, a domain, where English was used far more and in a mix with Cantonese than in you know, normal discourse. So what this meant was that there's more opportunity for spontaneous use and for the development of the English variety. And I'll give you one really concrete example. It's this term, Ga Yao, in Cantonese, which 
literally means add oil or add fuel. Okay? And it's used as a, as a term of exhortation, of encouragement. Okay? So your boyfriend left you, oh, you know, hang in there, gayao. Or, you know, oh, I have to study for exams, I'm so tired, oh, gayao. Right? So it, it's used widely in spoken discourse, of course, in um, written and, and texted discourse as well. Because of computer-mediated communication, what young Hong Kongers started doing was spelling out gayao, G-A-Y-A-U, or calcing it, translating it into English as add oil. So you'd have this on, on CM, in CMC in text, right? People would text. They might write the Chinese character. They might write gayao uh, using the Latin alphabet, or they might write add oil. And so this started spreading on, on CMC and computer-mediated communication. And before long, this actually started entering spoken discourse as well. So while, you know, a decade ago, my young Hong Kongers, uh, under, Hong Kong undergrads would laugh when I asked if anyone actually said "add oil, spoken discourse. Nowadays, it's actually used much more. And then because of um, the political protests in Hong Kong in 2014, and then later on in 2019, um, the term "add oil started to be used to encourage the protesters. It was used in, by artists and beamed up in, on some of the buildings where the protests were happening. And so there was a global platform for this use. It, um, people around the world sent in messages of encouragement to this um, project called the Ad Oil Machine. So Ad Oil started taking on a global angle, as it were, and started getting known. And I'll link this back to what we discussed about dictionaries, right? Because the use of ad oil, this term ad oil, started gaining currency, it started co coming to the attention of linguists. I started, I have been doing research on it and started writing about it. Journalists, you know, started writing about it. I happened to speak to a journalist and talked about these new forms of, of Hong Kong English coming up. And the Oxford English Dictionary started paying attention to this. And before long, it actually got included as one of the terms, one of the entries in the OED. So it's a really nice story of how language can change because of technology, because of political events and so on, and actually become come into popular use and then enter dictionaries and you know become uh, much more recognized and, and legitimized as part of the world Englishes. Talking of changes in language, why does popular slang change and what words are English speaking kids using these days? <laughs> That's a really um, fun question to ask and I'll have to, as I already admitted, I'm quite a dinosaur so if I need to know what slang kids are speaking these days, I actually have to eavesdrop on my 11 and a half year old son's <laughs> and teen niece's conversations. <laughs> Hello, darling. A little shout out to him there. And of course, do the research. Let's just take it back a little bit. You know, slang is vocabulary that's informal, traditionally used in spoken discourse. But of course, now, you know, widely, of course, on the internet and computer mediated communication. And it's often originating and used by members of particular in-groups to establish group identity, sometimes to exclude outsiders or both, right? And one finds this phenomenon in subcultures across countries, across languages. You have examples like, historically, historical examples like Cockney rhyming slang, that's a well-known one. And of course, there's a lot of attention to criminal slang. But of course, if we, let's just fast forward to today and it's really what's going on in the internet and in popular culture. And, um, social media trends, the popularity of TikTok and so on, nowadays are what really makes it easy for new slang to take hold, to spread virally and, um, you know, change really rapidly. Many of these, of the terms nowadays might seem quite new to the more dominant mainstream culture, but a lot of the times they have their origins and long histories of use in black culture, LGBTQ plus community, drag community, and other marginalized groups and subcultures, as is, you know, the, uh, um, the character of, of slang. 
And so if you ask me what words they're using these days, um, I had to do a little bit of research on this. And I'll just give you one example. And perhaps by the time I say this, it's already fallen out of favor. But perhaps the word chugi is one of the you know 2022 top slang terms, which refers to um, sort of very painfully mainstream character or, or, or holding on to things that were once cool but are not cool anymore. So now they're sort of basic or chuggy. And I'm sure I've explained it and used it in a completely chuggy way. <laughs> uh, so don't hate me, haters. <laughs> well, there you go. I might try and put that into a sentence somehow in the next couple of weeks. I've certainly learned something today. Um, Lisa, how did you come to research in this area, in the specific area you're, you've been looking at in the last couple of decades? Ah, thanks for asking that. It's you know really nice to reflect on on the journey, and I'll try to you know sort of keep it short. But I guess growing up in multilingual Singapore, and I've mentioned Singapore already before, it was so natural to have many languages in the mix and English, you know, that everyone used on an everyday basis, very spontaneously. And you know, as a layperson, before I started getting to linguistics, not really thinking about. Um, the variety one was using or how particular or characteristic it was. And it really was in my undergraduate, my first year as an undergraduate student in English language, where one of our British um, lecturers was teaching us something to do with grammar. And he had this way of you know, doing an analysis and then just saying to the lecture hall, happy? It was a rhetorical question and nobody answered. But the few of us who used to sit in the back of the class, the kind of naughty ones, one day decided that we would respond. And so when our lecturer, you know, finished an analysis and said in his very British English way, OK, so, you know, do you like that? Happy? And we, we sort of chanted happy in a very Singapore English accent. And he looked up and he said, oh, so it's happy and not happy. And that was one of the first times, I think, that it sort of really drove home to me how particular Singapore English was and you know, it got me really intrigued and inspired to look into differences because of the different local languages that have lent themselves to the features of Singapore English. And then, of course, fast forward to when I had done my PhD, which looked at Singapore English varieties. And then as one's career goes, you know, one encounters different scholars and different research areas and develops those areas. So I started working in language contact as well as in Creole studies, so looking at um, Creole languages as well. Or not least because my my husband and colleague is also a linguist working those areas. And, um, you know, my interest in looking at the influence of local languages on these evolving new varieties of English and also the implications of this for, you know, attitudes, education, language policy and so on. Um, which are stories too long to tell, I think, for now, um, and how, how important those, were, those are as well. Uh, and then, um, as mentioned, because of my interest and because of some of my research, I happened to be interviewed, interviewed by a journalist about Hong Kong English words. I spoke about some newly emerging ones, such as Ad Oil, which got a little bit of attention in the media. And as a result, I started conversations with editors of the South China Morning Post's Post magazine. And what I ended up with was a language matters column uh, for the Post magazine, which I've been writing for about more than three years now, which is published on a fortnightly basis. So in a nutshell, and that's how one's career develops. Keeping very busy there by the sounds of it. What are important subjects related to the English language that you'd like to see linguists more openly discuss, Lisa? Oh, such an important question and <laughs> so many things that one can talk about. I'll just mention a few and again, these tend to be related to my areas of interest. I really, you know, would be happy to see work that looks at new varieties of English, new Englishes, in particular those that have evolved in multilingual ecologies and show multilingual practices. And I haven't mentioned that I haven't mentioned this yet, but 
in addition to you know, influences on the pronunciation or some of the vocabulary, there are also practices which have traditionally been seen as hybrid practices where there's mixing of two languages. So this has traditionally been viewed as and termed code switching or code mixing, where you have English and another language or two or more languages mixed together or where the speaker switches between these languages. Nowadays, there's also a, a move looking at this phenomenon, which is termed translanguaging, right, where we're just sort of crossing different languages. And this has often or up till very recently been seen as, you know, switching between English and other languages. But in fact, this kind of practice is really normal, spontaneous practice in multilingual communities where speakers simply draw on all the different linguistic resources in their repertoire. In some contexts, such varieties are really the norm, right? A mixed variety is really the norm. So for example, in the Philippines, what is called Taglish, which is Tagalog and English, as a hybrid code, as a mixed code, is really the norm of Fil Filipinos. And it's been said that it's really, really difficult to find um, people speaking in pure, and I put pure in quote marks here with my fingers, pure English or pure Tagalog, because this hybrid code is really the code of multilingual communities. And this is common to multilingual communities across the world. So I think research on the English language or the English language varieties, but with a view to multilingual contexts and the fact that we can think about multilingual speakers of English, I think is a very important one. Another area is thinking about English and the English language in relation to minority languages, right? Often a dominant or global language such as English is what many minority language communities opt to shift to using for all the usual pragmatic reasons, you know, education, access to jobs, and so on. But this can and often does result in these heritage or minority languages becoming passed down much less to the next generation as the parents' generation sort of opts to use a global language such as English as a home language instead. And so minority languages then are potentially endangered, right, and start falling out of use. So this is another area I think that would be wonderful to see attention to, where we bring together work on English language and work on minority and endangered languages. And this is actually a very timely uh, topic because this year, 2022, is in fact the start of the United Nations International Decade of Indigenous Languages, where there's much attention being paid to raise awareness um, about the situation of indigenous languages and what can be done to help provide support and revitalization uh, of them. Um, another area is perhaps migration. It would be really important to continue to do work on the position of the English language as a global language alongside migrant languages, right, and how not is similar to the situation of minority languages, how you know, one can find a, you know, a very healthy balance and a very really healthy support of migrant languages. And perhaps finally for now, the implications for education. If we could have even more research and discussion about the different kinds of English varieties that are being spoken by communities worldwide and recall that, you know, there are these so-called traditional native varieties of English, which tend to be privileged, which tend to have higher status, where, uh, which have, tend to have much more positive attitudes towards them, British English, American English, even Australian English, and so on, in comparison to new varieties of English, such as those from Asia, from Africa, and so on, which even while they are completely leg legitimate, fully-fledged varieties in their own right, still tend to have, you know, less of a higher status, less of a prestige, less desired in more formal domains such as education. I think there needs to be more attention to this in terms of how these other English varieties are really actually very important for their communities of speakers. There's work, for example, happening here in Australia on Aboriginal Australian English and the part that plays 
in supporting education in the classroom. It's another wonderful story, perhaps for another day. Some really, really important subjects there that you've raised, Lisa, and definitely have very far-reaching impacts. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. Um, your research is really fascinating. We wish you all the best with what you're looking into. Thank you very much, Jess. It was a pleasure to be able to speak about these things with you. You've been listening to The Future Of, a podcast powered by Curtin University. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it. And if you want to hear from more experts, stay up to date by subscribing to us on your favourite podcast app. Join us next time. Mm-hmm.